En nombre del Centro de Derechos Humanos de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín y en nombre del Instituto Fe y Libertad, les damos la bienvenida a la conferencia Hiding in Plain Sight de Mr. Alan J. Hall. Alan Hall nació en Cracovia, Polonia, en 1935. Su nombre entonces era Adam Janusz Horowitz. Fue el hijo y el nieto mayor de una familia feliz, urbana y secular. Tenía cuatro años cuando los nazis invadieron Polonia en septiembre de 1939. Su familia entonces se mudó 400 kilómetros al este, a Lubov, entonces territorio polaco, pero hoy parte de Ucrania. Sin embargo, los nazis llegaron también a Lubov en 1941 y los Horowitz tuvieron que ingresar al gueto de la ciudad. La historia de los escondites de su familia y su supervivencia en tres ciudades, Lubov, Varsovia y de nuevo Cracovia, nos la contará el mismo Mr. Hall. Después de la guerra, la familia Horowitz, luego de muchas peripecias, logró llegar a Nueva York en febrero de 1947, pero aún allí sufrieron antisemitismo. En 1952 se mudaron a Miami Beach. Se hicieron ciudadanos estadounidenses en 1954 y fue entonces cuando adoptaron su nuevo apellido, Hall. Alan vive agradecido por la vida que ha podido vivir en Estados Unidos, donde se desempeñó como abogado y empresario. Y hoy dedica su tiempo, junto con su esposa, Lori, a alertar a jóvenes y todo público interesado contra los horrores del antisemitismo, del racismo y de las agresiones de todo tipo a la dignidad inmensurable de las personas. Démosle, por favor, la bienvenida a Mr. Alan J. Hall. This is my wife, Laurie Gold, and the reason she comes up, because oftentimes I like to, to say things very quickly and bypass important details. And as you will see very shortly, she will tug me and say, no, 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 too fast. Tell more about this, tell her more about that. So, and by the way, I am not turning senile, it's just I'm quick and she is more precise. We're both lawyers, we've practiced against each other. What I like very much, to the extent I can see, because this is light blaring in our eyes, I welcome your questions. So anytime, while I'm speaking, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask. Believe me, I will not forget my story, and I will not be bothered. I see there are a few empty seats here, and if there's anybody else that wants to join us, to some additional seats. At any rate, I was born in southern Poland, and the name of the city is Krakow. It was the old uh, historic capital of Poland. My mother was a professional violinist, and my dad was an insurance executive. My name was Adam Horowitz, and uh, of course, during the war, I've had many names, and if we have enough time, I'll tell you about how I got my current name. But uh, do you, has anybody here ever seen a phone book? My name I got out of a phone book. So I'll tell you more about that later. So at any rate, my life was excellent. I was the only child I was the only grandchild, and anything I wanted was mine to have. My grandparents lived on the same block down the street. My aunt, likewise, lived right down the street. And I was the little prince. That was under the first four and a half years of my life. And I was very, very fortunate because, as so many of you know, the child's psyche is created primarily in the first five years of his or her life. So most of that I got, and I got very well. What I remember first about the war was, um, is my, I never heard argument in my parents' home. Never. And all of a sudden, I observed my parents arguing. And I can tell you, after years of thinking about it, what they were arguing. Very simple. My father, 
who was educated in Vienna because Jews were not permitted to go to some of the best schools. There was a quota. 10% of the Polish population was Jewish, but the quota was only 5%. So in order to get to the better universities or even gymnasium, high school, you had to have connections, money, etc. And it just happened, my dad was the youngest of six children, and so I think their connections ran out by the time he got around. So he went to school in Vienna, and there were no such restrictions in Austria. Interestingly, my father went to some of the same school system as Hitler. You all know Hitler was not a German. He was an Austrian. At any rate, that was very important because he had really two primary languages. He was born in Poland, and so there Polish was our primary language, and he was educated in Vienna, so German was his primary language. And he spoke equally as well in either language. And that was a key to our survival. Uh, my father said to my mother, I know what the Germans are up to. I read the German newspapers and periodicals. They didn't keep it a secret. We got to get out of here. We got to get away from the, from the Germans. As they already, September 1, 1939, they attacked Poland. My mother said, 25% of the people in Krakow are of German descent. My family has been in Krakow for centuries. Germans are some of our best friends. There's nothing to be fearful of. They are very good people. In fact, our family had some of the Germans that married into the family. So this was the dialogue. Finally, in frustration, my father grabbed me by the hand and said, I cannot convince you, but, I, but the boy and I are, are going to Lvov, his hometown, where he felt he had a much better support network. You can stay if you, if you want, but I, I can't force you to go. And so, as he started dragging me out the door, my mother crying because she's seeing her only child being driven away from her, said, okay, okay, I'll come with you. Now, my parents were, uh, mar were married about 60 years. And there's only one time that I've ever heard my father say anything cruel to my mother. And here's what he said. My mother said, please, please, I will go with you, but let me say goodbye to my parents and my sister. And my father, my father said, no. It's the only time I've ever heard my father be cruel, cruel to my mother. He knew this kind of a goodbye will be a long, of long duration. He also knew that time was absolutely critical. So crying, my mother grabbed the stroller, grabbed what was the most expensive, important thing that she owned, which is a fur coat, and I can't tell you without smiling. In the middle of, in the beginning of September, a fur coat is rather unnecessary. She grabbed the most expensive thing that the family owned, a chest of silver, and the only other thing she grabbed was the family album. Anybody who's ever been in a war zone will tell you there is no public transportation in a war zone. And so, the only way we could go, and we travel about uh, 375 kilometers, about 220 miles, and we walked. We could actually sometimes see through the trees the military going through the highways, Polish military, German military. We walked through the back streets, through the back woods, and sometimes we ran parallel to the highways, otherwise times no. We would come to people at night. Some people were very generous. They gave us some food, gave us a place to sleep. Other people, less so, maybe just gave us some food or gave us a place to sleep, maybe in a barn. Other people, not so. And we would sleep in the open. Fortunately, it was September, and sometimes we just ate right off the plants. We would see fruit and fresh corn, and that was our, that's what we survived on. And then we came to a river. 
Now, most of us here would consider a normal river not that great an obstacle. But for us, it was a major obstacle. My parents could not swim, and at four and a half years of age, neither could I. And so, we found a ferry, and I want you to envision this as a rectangular boat with a flat bottom, with a line of people on each side, a horse and a wagon attached in the middle, and across the river we went. A man was pulling a rope on the left side, and a man on the right side was pulling. They had a long pole, was pushing us across the river. And that's the way we crossed that river. I would not take your time. I have a great deal of respect for each and every one of you. I would not take your time to tell you about that, but except that it is so important to my story. Because when we crossed that river, we did not know. And yet, anybody who's been in a war zone know, you don't know anything that's going on in a war zone. You may think you know, but you really don't. We did not know we were crossing from the Nazi-controlled part of Poland to the Soviet-controlled part of Poland. And that single act bought us 20 months of life. Now, for us, we struggled to stay alive day by day, minute by minute. And what I say to you, frequently, the challenge was to stay alive the next one or two minutes. Our idea of long-term planning, how do we survive this day? We could never think more further in the future than that. Um, we finally got to, to, war, to Lvov, which is my dad's hometown. Almost instantly, life became normal. It's amazing how rapidly life goes back to normalcy. Uh, my dad got a job. We got an apartment. Of course, we, my dad knew a lot of people there. That was his hometown. And next thing we knew, life was quiet. The only thing that was different than ordinary life was that every day, without fail, my mother would write a letter to her sister, to her cousins, to her mother, to her father. And every day she would put the letter in a mailbox. And in almost two years' time, not a single letter was ever returned, and not a single letter was answered. My mother in 1995, correct? My mother died in 1995. In 1995, she went to her grave, never knowing why not a single letter was answered. About five or six years after she died, I found out. As soon as the Nazis took control of, of Krakow, they brought all the Jewish people, not just from Krakow, but from the whole area, brought them to a, a, a square, a large square, which is still com commemorated for that event. And then, there from there, they were taken by truck to Plashov concentration camp. And those who survived Plashov, my grandparents did not, uh, when they were taken to Auschwitz. And let me tell you about Auschwitz for a moment, and I'm digressing from my own story. Many of you might think, well, this happened 75 years ago. It happened to Jewish people. It's no, not important to me. I have a surprise for you. Auschwitz was not built for Jews. It was built for Christians. The first two or three years in Auschwitz, it was almost exclusively a concentration camp for Christians. A Maidanic, notorious camp, and I also Auschwitz, by the way. Same thing. And I'm only mentioning two. But there are many. Who do you think the last internees were in Auschwitz and Majdanek? Not Jews. Christians. And the point of the story is this. And I'll te tell you more about it. When, and I will repeat this again. When any one of us is in danger... We're all in danger. There was a priest that once said this. When they came after the, when they came for the communists, I didn't object. I'm not a communist. 
When they came after the Jews, I didn't object. I'm not Jewish. When they came after the gypsies, I didn't object. I'm not a gypsy. When they came after the, uh, anyway, I can go on and on and on. When they came for me, there was nobody to object. So we're all in this boat together. So that you understand, let me make my point. There's no doubt six million Jews died in the Holocaust. Actually, 6.2 million. And the reason I say there's no doubt is very simple. We know the number of Jewish people in Europe before the war. We know the number of survivors after the war. It's a very simple piece of arithmetic. You don't have to be a genius. These people didn't disappear into thin air. They were murdered. Um, but I want to tell you more, because it was more than just the six million Jews. In the camps alone, just the camps, and the numbers about Christians are not as, not as clear, because it's a much larger community. But somewhere between two and five million, closer to four or five million, Christians died in the same camps in the same way. It was not just a Jewish issue. But if you're not convinced with that, I'll tell you something else. In Europe, the non-combatants, civilians' death, people like you, 80 million people died. Eight, zero. Of which six million were Jews. Again, when one of us is in trouble, everyone is in trouble. If you see evil today, resist, because tomorrow that evil may touch you. Regarding concentration camps, ghettos, concentration camps, places where people were held against their wishes, against their will. Is there anybody here who would like to venture to guess how many there were? And then I'll answer your question. Would you tell me how many, what do you think? How many concentration camps? How many? I don't know, 30? 30. The question was, had the Europeans learned? It is such an easy question to answer. No. No explanation necessary. No. No. And I would like, I like to scream and say no. No, they have not learned. Why? Look at France. Jews are being attacked on the streets. Look at England. The English people, the British people, are afraid of the others. This is insane. What happened to the police? Of course not. They've not learned a thing. In Poland, I go to Poland regularly. No, they have not learned anything. But let me finish my question. Thank you for the question. Let me just finish. There were 15,000, 15,000, 15,000 concentration camps and ghettos. It's not easy to kill 11 million people. It's hard work. I was apprehended twice by the Nazis. Once we were involved right after the Germans took over. And by the way, my first experience with the Holocaust, there was a little card, nothing, nothing too threatening, just a piece of paper that said you have to leave your apartment and have to move to another address. Well, what we thought was somebody wanted, some German officer wanted a very nice place. We had nice furniture and all that. So it's a shame, but we can replace all those things, no big deal. We go to the address that's given to us, and to my surprise, there was another family living there. Well, that we were not prepared for. And a few days later, a third family moved in. We were not being moved to another apartment. We were being moved into the ghetto. In Poland, I never heard the word ghetto. I first heard it here in the United States. It was the Jewish section. It was the Jewish compound. And so, once we were there, immediately bad things started happening. The first thing was, my dad was warned that there was going to be a roundup for children. And until very recently, I thought it was the only time, the only time it ever happened. 
I just learned within the last month that there were many roundups of children. And in order to keep me safe, my father sent me to a farm outside of Lvov for a safe house, for safety. When I was walking to the railroad station, all of a sudden the street got blocked off. Well, a truck came in, blocked the end of the street, and I saw the Germans jumping off the back of the truck, and we, went, we turned around and tried to go the other way. The other end of the street was also blocked off, and I was, I, I was on the street. I was literally the first, ch first child taken. They put me on the back of the truck, and then I heard, I didn't see, I heard them storm into the apartment houses around on that block, and I heard the screams as the children were being wrestled away from their parents and brought down to the truck with me, loaded on a truck. When the truck was full, then we were taken to what I thought until recently was a police station. I am now relatively confident it was no police station. There was a concentration camp on the edge of Lvov, which is the city where we're in. And there I was put into a compound, into a corral with these other children. There was a partition about 39 inches high, one meter, and above that was glass. And I stood right next to the partition. I was the first one there, and I could see through the glass. And that's where I stood hour after hour. I knew not to, not to create, not to attract attention to myself, as you saw um, before, the name of my book is Hiding in Plain Sight, and that's where I started hiding in plain sight at that event. And I was, and I, I saw my dad walk through the front door. I knew this was my salvation. He was going to take care of me. He saw me, I saw him, and then I saw him speak to the Nazi in charge. And I thought, this is great. Um, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be saved. Then I saw my dad turn around without looking at me, walk out, and leave me there. And I thought, even at the age of seven, I was about seven then, that my father, my own father, left me there to die. Because that's, that's what I knew. That was, going, that was going, what was going to happen. That was fairly clear. Several hours later, my dad returned. I was not so happy the second time. If my father would abandon me twice, once, then perhaps he would abandon me again. And this time, he spoke to the Nazi again, and to my total surprise, they, I thought they shook hands, they didn't. Uh, to my total surprise, the Nazi walked away. And my father looked at me, just as I'm looking at this gentleman right here, our eyes locked, and he went just like that. Well, all of us know what this means. I knew where the door was. I left the corral with the children, joined my father, and we walked out of there. About a month ago, I was interviewed by the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and the interviewer, when she heard the story, told me there were many children's roundups. I did not know that until then. And she said, to the best of their knowledge, of the museum's knowledge, I'm the only one that has ever survived one of these roundups. I still see, now even back then I knew that those children were going to be executed within a matter of hours. And I still see those children in compound, and I guess that's the survivor's guilt. I always see those children. <clears throat> they, will, they will be with me till the day I die, those children. Um, so do, do I feel guilty for surviving? I don't know. But I can't get those children out of my mind. What was the handshake? Oh, well, my father said very simply, how much do you want from one of those children? Never identify me. It would be too, too dangerous. And the Nazi said, the price, in terms of ounces of gold and carrots of diamonds. And when my father left, 
He went to his mother, he went to his sister, he went to his relatives, he went to his friends, and bit by bit got the amount of gold and diamonds that were necessary to buy me, to bribe the to Nazi, and that's why I'm alive today. And he was the only one that had the courage to walk to the Nazi commandant and bargain with him. What yeah. did the Nazi say to him? Well, the Nazi threatened to kill him right there on the spot. But my father said, I'm offering you gold and diamonds. Why would you want to kill me? At any rate, let's move on. We knew from that moment on that you cannot survive in a ghetto. We could not survive in a ghetto. So at that time, by the way, initially, early on, and we're talking about now 1941, the ghettos didn't have walls. They might have some to barbed wire, but they really did not have walls. That came later. That was 42. So we snuck out of the ghetto. Excuse me. My parents got false identification papers that indicated we were Christian, not Jewish, because religion was marked on the ID papers. And we uh, snuck out of the ghetto, and we started hiding in plain sight in the Christian community, we would rent a room in somebody's house, we would rent a room in somebody's apartment, stay for three days, stay for a week, stay for two weeks, move on. We could never stay too long in any one, in one place. We don't want to attract attention to ourselves. You know, people come and go two, three, four days, people don't pay attention to you. After a while, they want to know learn more about you. And it was time to go. At any rate, uh, one landlady got suspicious. Got suspicious. Oh, this is a great picture. Notice a man's face. Notice his face. That's very important. Look at his nose. I'll tell you more about that later. We were moving around, and most of the time, not always, my mother and I stayed together, and my father would be in another place. Because three faces was much more than two faces. And people generally don't pay attention to a mother and child. Uh, a family, much more so. And so, early, early on, right about that time that I'm talking to you, my father went to a physician, and he had a large, bulbous, hooked nose, and he said, you see this? This is my death warrant. Give me a nose job, a rhinoplasty. Well, the doctor said no. And my father said, you see this? If I don't live, my wife has no chance of survival. Please, do the rhinoplasty. The doctor said, I can't. I don't have an assistant. I don't have any anesthetic. I don't have a full supply of tools. I can't. My father said, I'll come to your house. Don't worry about the anesthetic. Please. Man, that doctor said, I cannot do it. Finally, my father played his ace card. He said, I have a seven-year-old son. If I die and, my mother, and his mother dies, this child has no chance of survival. None. Well, do you want to have the knowledge that you will cause the death of a seven-year-old child? The doctor very reluctantly, and by the way, they could not bring a Jewish person to the hospital. That was forbidden very reluctantly said, okay, come to my house. I cannot promise you anything, but I'll try my best. Well, the doctor did a terrific job. Not that, not that, not that face. No, 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 no. What he did gave my father a very straight, aquiline, Aryan nose that would be worth a magazine Picture. What he did was the doctor operated, Alan's father drank half a bottle of whiskey. What? Vodka, vodka. <laughs> he held a pan. Like this. Handed the doctor the tools. Whatever came out, the bones and blood and whatever came into the pan and continued to hand to, to him until the operation was over. Thank you. At any rate, 
the face heals very rapidly. A week later, my father was, you would never know he had anything done. And it was beautiful, but you see that face. You see my father's nose, it looks like he was a beat up old boxer. What happened about six months later, the stitches melted, and that was the nose he was with, he had the rest of the war. Doesn't look Jewish, he looks like a criminal, but doesn't look Jewish. Well, most Nazis were criminals, so he just fit right in. Huh. Then, what he did, the, the, you see, in my family, I know him as a hairy guy. I have more hair than my dad or my brother. And so, he bleached his hair. He said, women bleach their hair? Why can't I? So he became a blonde with this beat-up face and spoke perfect German, and he passed for a Nazi. And that was the that was a subsequent survival. Now, the landlady, getting back to the story, the landlady called the cops, called the police. Two police officers came, very courteous, not at all belligerent, Polish police, not Germans. They said, we have a report that you're Jewish. We'll take you downtown and get it straightened out. My mother and I knew we were in deep, deep trouble. My father happened to be away. He wasn't, he wasn't with us that moment. And one, and they took us in a horse-drawn cab, like in a, anybody of you know Central Park, you know, the horses, etc. Uh, one police officer stayed in the cab with us, and the other one went inside. 45, uh, in 2015 or thereabouts, thereabouts we found the building they took us to. It was, the, it was the Gestapo headquarters. It was the bad of the bad. And thank goodness, they didn't take us inside. We stayed outside. The Germans never bothered to look at us. And for those of you who are not Jewish, this might interest you. They weren't interested whether we were Jewish or not. They said, take them across the street to the railroad station. In that railroad station, the trains, we just missed a train going out, and the trains from there went to Treblinka. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time telling you about Treblinka, but I'll tell you this. It was primarily, no, it was exclusively a killing center. It was a not, not a concentration camp, although you hear people describe it as a, as a concentration camp. It was not. There was no place for, sleep, for dormitories, no sleeping accommodations. There were no dining facilities. It was a killing center. Everybody that went there was supposed to die that day. The, the, the uh, gas chambers continued working until all the people that came in that day were dead. The problem was, and the reason I'm alive today, the only reason I'm alive today, is that the burial brigade could not keep up with the gas chambers. And the mountains of bodies that were created, human bodies degenerate very quickly. And so the camp commandant was apprehensive that the diseases that might be coming out of the human bodies would infect the guards. He stopped the trains for five days. I was waiting for the train for the first two and a half of those five days. And because I was eight, seven, maybe eight years old by that time, and I was rather an active little boy, and otherwise known as a pain in the neck, they sent me to an orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. And then, of course, five days later, the trains started running again. To give you just a quick synopsis of Treblinka, 800,000 people, almost exclusive Jews, Jews but not 100%, were murdered in 16 months. Just at one place, Treblinka. And uh, would you like to know how many survivors there were of, of the people that went in? Zero. Not one. At the end, at the end when the Soviets were coming, etc., the 250 slave laborers that were there pulling the bodies out of the gas chambers, rebelled and fought the Germans. 165 of them survived. 
uh, 80 or so, 80, 82, uh, survived the war. They were hidden mostly by French resistance, and some, some were hidden in Polish forests. And the very last of these slave laborers died two years ago. I, I had the fortune of, good fortune of, of meeting him. So, but of the people that were taken in by the trains, anywhere between three and 15,000 per day, not one person survived. Right after that, my father persuaded a Polish uh, trolley car worker in Warsaw, this is in all in Warsaw, to save me. Okay? Uh, and what he did is the man came in, he was a Christian. And by the way, probably the most courageous person I've ever met. Came to the orphanage and said that he was there to save me. He was there to take me out. Well, I, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, at any rate, I, uh, I would not leave with him. So what he did was he said, I will not leave you here. I didn't believe him. He spoke to the adults. I have no idea what he ever said to the adults. But they walked me out and they locked the gate behind me. So there I was on a strip, on a street, with this man I, that I really did not like. And then he said, here's it, put the cap on, pulled the brimway down, took my hand, he said, whatever you do, don't let go of my hand. Don't look up. Don't look up. Don't, and don't say a word. And we walked right the main, down the main street of the Warsaw Ghetto, right to the guard station. All I saw, was, I wasn't permitted to look up, all I saw was a pedestal and a pair of boots. And he said, and the guard said, who are you? What are you doing here? And he said, oh, I just brought my son here to see these Jews. These Jews. And the guard looked at us, said, you must be stupid. It's almost curfew. Curfew comes, the patrols come out in the street, and they shoot on sight. Run home and pray that you can get home before they shoot you down. That's the way I was snuck out of Warsaw Ghetto. I oftentimes wonder, would I have the courage to do that, what he man did? He, then he disappeared. <clears throat> After the war, we couldn't find him. And the way people protected themselves, they never gave their address, they never gave their name, so that if the Nazis caught us, they could torture us to death. We couldn't give them up. There was no way. Um, then my dad, socializing with some Nazis, found a place in the tallest building in, in, in Poland, second tallest building in Europe, and he claimed that he had a defense factory. Anyway, he rented a two-room suite of offices for one purpose only, and my mother and I hid in a supply closet in this office building for two years. We were totally safe and secure there, and I could tell you so much more about it. But I think what we'll do is make our, my memoir available to anybody here, and uh, uh, you can learn more that way. At any rate, two years later, an airway warden during the Polish uprising in Warsaw found us, insisted we go down bomb shelter when we did that, and a bomb penetrated the entire building, wound up in the bomb shelter with us, and we had to leave the bomb shelter. We crawled on our hands and knees under sniper fire, moved to another bomb shelter, where my mother and I were separated for the first time, and much to my surprise, surprise my brother was born in the second bomb shelter. His birth weight, ladies, so was less than two pounds, less than one kilo. He was a little nothing. My mother had, because of malnutrition, no milk. There were no other women in that area breastfeeding. There was no animals. So really, there was no way for him to, lie, to, to survive. One physician said, well, if you feel you have to do something for this baby, give him some sugar water. To you, this may sound like nothing, but we hadn't seen sugar in four years. All of a sudden, a bag of sugar showed up. 
We fed my brother a teaspoonful of sugar water every half hour, and indeed he did survive. In fact, my brother just died three months ago. But um, he, I thought, was going to be cause, cause of our death. Because for four years, we were surviving by not being noticed, by not being seen. With a newborn baby, you can't do that. I was 100% wrong because a physician wanted to save the baby, bandage my mother's face up so you couldn't see her features. I was told to sit still, face down. Nobody could see anything but more than the top of my head. I was used to that. And they put us in a hospital train, and we thought we were going to Germany. In fact, that hospital train took us back to Krakow, uh, where we were liberated four months later. And that's basically my survivor's story on the Holocaust. However, we thought the Russians were the best thing since bread came along. And believe it or not, my father wound up being incarcerated by the Russians, being sent to Siberia. He had to escape from prison, Russian prison. My brother and I walked two years old, and I was 11. He, would, he rode on my back for uh, several hundred miles, and we walked. He got sick, so we, never, we were walking to Israel. We never got to Israel. Uh, and my, pa my parents found us in Baden, south of Vienna. Uh, we were reunited. We went to Paris, waited for five months, and in 1947, came to the United States, January of 1947. I came to the United States, should have gone to sixth grade. I was placed in the fifth grade. No English. There was only new Polish, German, French, and Russian. Uh, and, and had no, did not know how to read, did not know how to write, and had no arithmetic. In a year and a half, when I went to junior high school, the teachers taught me everything. And I always say to people, it's not a matter of how smart you are. It's a matter of how much you want to learn. Because today, I have a doctorate, and yet I read on fifth grade level. But I read, and I read, and if I have to stay up at night to study, I will do that. So my grades have always been good. And that's just a simple matter of desire to do that. Obviously, a small problem is much easier to deal with than a large problem. By the way, when Hitler gained power lawfully in Germany, 6% of the German people, only 6% of the German people, were in the Nazi party. 94% weren't. And then most of them didn't even like the Nazis. If you see a problem, you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it probably gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And after a while, you can't deal with it. When you see something bad, whether it's bullying in school or in the government or wherever, you got to address it while it's still small. You can't let it go. As Eli, Eli Wiesel said, the real perpetrators were the people that stayed silent, were the people that ignored, that were hoping it would pass by. Frankly, my mother was one of them. My mother thought the Germans were good people. It would work itself out. Hitler was just a blip. Hitler will go away. Boy, was she wrong.